Well, good morning, everyone. We uh, have a new song for you this morning. I think that you'll learn it fairly easily. Um, I'm, I'm trying to uh, multitask right now. I'm trying to talk to you and then make sure that we have our kids, our Sunday school kids choir, lined up in the narthex because they're going to be entering in on this first song and um, uh, then singing a couple of tunes for us. Anybody see uh, Betty and the kids back there? Okay, I see Betty. Betty, have you got kids? They're working on it. Okay, you have about three minutes to get them assembled and come in, and uh, we'll uh, have them come in as we sing our opening number, uh, Prepare the Way. Hear from the kids. kids. 
with that, we usher in our Palm Sunday feast and holiday today. This is the day that the Lord has made. You know, those words are from Psalm 118, which we say just virtually every week, but uh, they're especially appropriate for uh, today for Palm Sunday because they're part of uh, the royal psalm of entrance, which uh, was recited or sung when um, a king was entering into Jerusalem. And so uh, we say that every Sunday, but we say it with special emphasis on this Sunday. Behold, your king is coming. He comes to you. And this is the day that the Lord has made, and we rejoice and are glad in it. Um, as part of that celebration, there's a friendship pad near you, uh, near the center aisle of the pew, and if you would kindly take that out right now, beautify it with your name, uh, pass it on down if there are other people in your row. That is one of the ways that we facilitate uh, friendship and fellowship. It's also one of the ways that we mark your attendance here if you happen to be a confirmation family, and that's pretty important to us as well. Um, we are entering into the most important services of the church year. Today is Palm Sunday, but we have the great blessing of following in the footsteps of Jesus in His journey during this most special week through the exaltation of Palm Sunday to our Lord's Last Supper and His betrayal on Thursday night, and then on Friday, of course, the trial and crucifixion of our Lord and His burial in the tomb. And of course, that leads to Easter Sunday, the third day he arose from the grave, and uh, that is, of course, the vindication of our Lord and the guarantee of our salvation. And so, we invite you to walk with us during these very special services, but we also are inviting you to be bringers and inviters of others. And for that, uh, please be praying about who you might bring and invite to these services. We want to share the story of Christ and of His salvation for us to as many people as possible. And so, uh, please be praying about uh, a person that you could bring or invite. Uh, please also pray for the family of Alice Seems' son-in-law, Michael Coy of New Richland. He passed away on Wednesday, and be also praying for Alice herself. Uh, who recently had a bout in the hospital. She may still be there today, in fact, uh, to help regulate her blood pressure. But please keep that family in your prayers. We're still receiving sign-ups for our Easter dinner. Uh, we're hosting that on behalf of the community this next Sunday. And there are still uh, spots available. If you happen to know somebody who can be blessed by that uh, dinner, then please let them know that they should contact us. And also, if you are willing to help, uh, we could still use some extra hands. There are sign-up sheets in the narthex for those who want to join us for the meal or if you simply want to help. No one should be alone on Easter Sunday, and that's uh, something that we uh, really want to stress. The Know Your Church survey is going on right now. You probably have received an email and a link to that survey. We want to encourage you to uh, take that survey. And um, in addition to that, in addition to filling out the survey, it takes about 20 minutes or so. If you haven't done so already, please put these two dates on your calendar. Thursday evening, April 11th at 6.30 p.m. and Saturday morning at 9.30 a.m. On Thursday evening, April 11th, we'll be covering the Know Your Community study with our consultants, Ron Youngdale and Joel Corshin. And that should be very interesting as we learn more about the kind of people who live in our community. You might think that you know the community pretty well, but there are a few surprises in that survey that I think uh, we'll see. Then on Saturday morning, we will be going with our consultants through the results of the Know Your Church survey. And that is, again, for the whole congregation. And that meeting might actually include a discussion about future property plans and our ministry needs. And so there's important stuff coming up. Please put those two dates on your calendar. These are the announcements. The peace of the Lord be with you. Let's take a few moments uh, to rise and share that peace with each other.
Peace be with you. Peace be with you, Matt. Peace be with you, Chris. Peace be with you, King. Please remain standing as we sing our opening song. Thank you. 
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Scriptures are clear that if we say we are without sin, we're just deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So please take a few moments at this time in silence as we bring our prayers of confession before the throne of God's grace. Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God has had mercy on us, and for the sake of his Son, Jesus Christ, and by his blood, he forgives us all our sins. On this your true confession, and in obedience to the Lord's command, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, you sent your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, to take upon himself our flesh and to suffer death upon the cross. Mercifully grant that we may follow the example of his great humility and patience and be made partakers of his resurrection through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated as we continue to worship by the reading and hearing of God's holy word. Good morning. Our Old Testament lesson comes from Zechariah chapter 9, verses 9 through 12. Rejoice, said the prophet, for your king is coming, humble and riding on a donkey. The word of the Lord was given to God's people, saying, Israel's king will rule the nations and set the prisoners free. He will bring, pre- bring peace and restore their fortunes. Zechariah chapter 9, verses 9 through 12. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the war horse from Jerusalem, and the battle bow shall be cut off, and he shall speak peace to the nations. His rule shall be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. As for you also, because of the blood of my covenant with you, I will set your prisoners free from the waterless pit. Return to your stronghold, O prisoners of hope. Today I declare that I will restore to you double. Here ends the first reading. Our psalm, Psalm 118, verses 19 through 29, if you'd please read it with me responsively. I'll read the odd if you would read the even. Open to me the gates of righteousness, that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Save us, we pray. O Lord, O Lord, we pray, give us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is God, and he has made his light to shine upon us. Bind the festal sacrifice with cords up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, God, and I will will give thanks thanks to you. You are my God, and I will extol you. O give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Our second reading today comes from Paul's letter to the Philippians. St. Paul quoted a hymn that would have been well known to the Philippian congregation, saying that Jesus humbled himself in his earthly life, taking on the form of a servant. His servanthood and obedience led him to death on the cross. Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Here ends the second reading. Please stand as you are able for the reading of the gospel. The Holy Gospel today is from the Gospel according to St. John, the 12th chapter, verses 12 through 32. The next day, the large crowd 
had come to the feast, the large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. And Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, just as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written about him and had been done to him. The crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to bear witness. The reason why the crowd went to meet him was that they heard he had done this sign. So the Pharisees said to one another, you see that you are gaining nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. Now among those who went up to worship at the feast were some Greeks. So these came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and asked him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew. Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. And Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly, truly, I say to you, Unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Whoever loves his life loses it, and whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, he must follow me, and where I am, there will my servant be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? But for this purpose, I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowd that stood there and heard it said that it had thundered. Others said, an angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered, this voice has come for your sake, not mine. Now is the judgment of this world. Now will the ruler of this world be cast out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. This is the word of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated, and I'll call the children to come forward for the children's sermon. So kids, come on down. (laughs) Excuse me. Okay, so a um, little brief pop quiz here. Um, so what kind of animal did Jesus ride into Jerusalem on that day? Go ahead, Isaac. A donkey, yeah. Have, have you ever wondered why it was a donkey, of all things? Why not a horse? You know, wouldn't a horse look nicer? I mean, horses are generally considered more attractive creatures than donkeys. I mean... You know, a horse can be real tall and stately looking, and, you know, whenever, whenever like in the movies, you know, there's, there's a general on a horse, I mean, he, he looks pretty magnificent, and um, you would think that Jesus would come in on a horse, and so why does he come in on a donkey? Do you have any idea? Well, Elsa, that is a very good answer. She said, because the scriptures say that he would come in on a donkey. (laughs) Um, Well, you know, uh, uh, I I had um, uh, a young person say in the early service, and he basically stole my sermon. I could have handed him my sermon notes, and we would have been good to go. Um, He said, uh, Jesus came in on a donkey because the horse signifies the power of the world, and the donkey signifies the kind of power that Jesus had, the power that comes from God. And I was about ready to just hand him my notes and say, all right, amen. Um, But you're absolutely right. The scriptures say it. A prophet named Zechariah prophesied that the Messiah would come riding a donkey about 500 years before Jesus. Um, But the reason why the donkey is so important to our story is because military guys 
uh, generals who just had won a battle would come into the city on a horse. They were men of war, and uh, actually, they probably had blood on their hands. And Jesus does not come as a man of war. He comes as a man of peace. And everybody back then knew that if you were going to uh, uh, have some kind of procession where you came into the city uh, and uh, you were coming in peace, then you, as the leader, would come in not on a horse but on a donkey. And so Jesus is announcing that he is a man of peace. He doesn't come to make war with us. He doesn't come to uh, uh, start a battle. He doesn't come as a military commander. He comes as one who announces peace, peace between God and us, and he comes to make that peace happen. And that's kind of what Holy Week is all about, is that what happens this coming week, Jesus is going to make peace happen. He's going to the big word is reconcile. He's going to uh, effect uh, reconciliation. He's going to reconcile us to God and God to us. Something is going to happen this week that will make that happen. And what, what do you think might be happening this week? What are the other days that we have this week that we celebrate? Okay, Easter is true. Yeah, that's right. But before Easter, what do we have? Uh, today's Palm Sunday. I'm thinking about uh, maybe around Wednesday, Thursday. Ma Maundy Thursday, okay. Oh, yes, Maundy Thursday, the Last Supper. And then what happens on Friday? Is it, a, is it bad Friday? Is it good Friday? Good Friday, and that's the day that Jesus is crucified, and that's how he makes peace between God and us. And so keep that in mind, and uh, keep it in mind that Jesus comes in on a donkey because he comes in peace. Let's stand up and pray, all right? So bow your heads, close your eyes, put your hands together, and let's pray. Lord Jesus Christ, our God, help us to learn the lesson of why you rode a donkey and not a horse. Help us, Lord, to receive the peace that you offer us, the peace that you bring about between us and God our Father. We thank you for that peace, Lord. We thank you for what you did, for coming and dying on the cross, and we thank you for Easter morning when we can celebrate that you truly did win the victory for us. We thank you, Lord Jesus Christ. In your name we pray, and all God's people said, Amen. Okay, thank you guys. Once again, the Lord be with you. Behold your king is coming. That's the theme. That's the theme for today. Behold, your king is coming. Chances are you've probably seen a few uh, triumphal entrances over the years, whether they were uh, winning sports teams or maybe a smiling politician or two. Ever see a smiling politician? They ever come to Waseca, by the way? Smiling politicians? Hmm, doesn't sound like it. Okay, so you've never seen one of them, right? How about uh, fabulous entertainers who have a grand entrance on stage? You know, if you go to one of their live shows, uh, there's a lot of stage effects, there's a lot of excitement, a lot of charisma going on. But chances are you've seen a triumphal entry or two. The Word of God asks us to focus on something different, though. The Word of God says, Behold your King. Behold means to look, and not just to look, but to see intently, to look in order to discern something that's beneath the surface. Behold means to pay attention, to look beyond superficial appearances. And so when you look, I mean when you really look, when you truly look at Jesus, what do you see? 
Zechariah the prophet, some 500 years before Jesus, saw this, Behold, your king comes to you. But just what kind of a king is this coming king? Like you just heard in the children's sermon, um, we might expect a military hero. A lot of Jews were expecting that. They expected a Messiah figure to come in on a stallion, maybe a white stallion. But Zechariah's words invites us to look more closely. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he. Humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Conquering generals rode stallions. This Messiah rides a donkey, meaning he comes to his people as a man of peace, not a man of war. There's, um, if you read the book of Zechariah, there's plenty of war and retribution on Jerusalem's enemies that Zechariah prophesies, but peace is really the major theme of the book, and that ultimately means peace with the nations. Jerusalem, according to Zechariah, would someday be a city without walls, a city that didn't need to worry about enemies, a city which was open to people of all kinds. Some people in Zechariah's day didn't like that vision. It seems that they craved judgment on the nations more than they loved peace. And maybe there's a few people around like that today. Behold, your king is coming to you, he says, on a donkey. He's a man of peace. Five hundred years after Zechariah, Jesus comes into Jerusalem, and he's riding a donkey. And so, what do people see? What are they beholding if they're beholding anything? The enemies of Jesus complain. Behold, they say, same word, behold, the whole world has gone after him. Jesus' disciples don't seem to understand what's going on. Uh, they see all of this, the donkey, they see the palm branches, the shouts of Hosanna, but they don't get it. That's what John tells us anyway. Some of the participants in the parade uh, who were around, though, when, when uh, Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, well, maybe they understand something, and they continue to witness, we are told, so, did they behold Jesus clearly? We don't know for sure. Then there are some Greeks in town, and they are there for the feast, which means possibly they are converts to Judaism, to the Jewish faith. They find Philip the disciple, and they say to him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus, or uh, to translate it a little bit more literally, Sir, we wish to behold Jesus. It's the same verb. What will these Greek seekers behold? What will they see? What will they understand? What will they pay attention to? And Jesus answers their query with this. Now is the hour for the Son of Man to be glorified. But behold, pay attention, because Jesus isn't talking about any ordinary glorification ritual. He, Jesus is not talking like a smiling politician or a charismatic entertainer who will be idolized by an adoring crowd. This is no conquering king who will go up to the Temple Mount and will challenge the Romans to a showdown and uh, rule over them. No, that's not what Jesus has in mind. But in order to see past what they see with their eyes, they will have to truly behold truly see beyond the surface, truly look. Look even when their eyes start to burn up with what they see in front of them, the unimaginable. They must somehow see what our unaided eyes would not see. And the truth of it is that nobody can really behold this coming king, not the Greek visitors, not the disciples, nor the people who are waving palm branches, probably because it was in the history books that that's what the Jews did 170 years before when a military hero by the name of Simon Maccabeus came into town. That's what they did, palm branches and all. Nor even some who might have witnessed Lazarus raised from the dead, 
nobody can really behold, behold this coming king. The problem is none of us could have understood what it meant when Jesus said, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Because all that we have been accustomed to in this world is smiling politicians, entertainers, military parades, and sports teams that are champs for one year. That's all we know of glory, and our eyes are blinded by that earthly glory. There's a line in an old hymn, some of you know it, it's called Holy, 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 that perfectly captures our predicament. Though the eye made blind by sin, thy glory may not see. That states it very clearly. We are blinded by our own ideas of what glory ought to look like. Our eyes are made blind by sin. You know, a couple of weeks ago I preached look and live, but we can't look. Today we're preaching behold your king, but we can't behold. Not unless we hear the word of God which frees us. Not unless we hear the gospel. And the gospel which is the power unto salvation is this that though he was in the form of God, he did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but made himself nothing. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death upon a cross. That is the word that frees us. And so is God most glorified when he is actually most humbled? humbled to death on a cross. Well, in a world that is saturated in sin, where the ruler of this world is Satan and must be cast out, as Jesus said, in an upside-down world such as this, think about it for a moment. If the entire world is upside-down, then maybe the only thing that really makes sense is that God incarnate would end up dying on a cross. And if that statement does make sense to you, then it makes sense because God's Spirit and His Word has revealed it to your heart. You're not acting or thinking by yourself. Behold, your King comes to you. And so behold that Jesus is the suffering Savior. Jesus is sorrowful. His soul is troubled. He's not feeling triumphant. He's feeling troubled, deeply troubled. That's what he tells his disciples. But in that he is troubled, that he's sorrowful, nothing comes as greater comfort to us in our suffering than to know that Jesus knows what you're going through. He knows exactly how you feel. He knows the pit in your stomach. He knows the loneliness of what you walk through. And instead of keeping his distance, he draws near to you. Behold, your king comes to you. In John chapter 11, verse 27, a few verses before our passage today, Martha says something that is really a bit strange when Jesus asks if she believes that he is the resurrection and the life. She says, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. She doesn't say who came into the world or who is about to come into the world. She says, I believe you are the Son of God who is coming into the world. In other words, Jesus came, that's true. He's coming again, we believe that, and that's true as well. But this is coming. It's it's the present participle verb tense which makes Martha's statement highly unusual because she's implying that Jesus is continually coming into this world. Now, I know that, you know, as I start to talk about grammar, I I can see it already, you know. The eyes are beginning to roll back into your head, and, uh, you know, I got to work a little harder to keep some of you with me here. And once I start talking about grammar, it's out the window. I mean, yeah, yeah. You don't get too excited about grammar, but receive this as God's Word. When people, when when God's people begin to suffer, as we often do in this world, behold, your King is coming to you. 
And this is why we can endure our sufferings, because Jesus is with us and He is coming to us. Behold also that our King not only suffers, but that He dies. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Would anyone have watched the death of Jesus, would, would have watched the crucifixion and surmised that that, in fact, was a rebirth, a new beginning? I doubt it. But that's exactly what Jesus says here. Faith sees the death of Christ, not as just death, but as the rebirth of the world. He falls to the ground dead. But Jesus is actually seed. In fact, he is the seed, the seed of Abraham, the seed of God. And from the moment that that spear pierces his side and blood and water pours out, from that moment the church is brought into being. It starts out as John and three women called Mary, but the seed already is beginning to multiply and as Jesus foretold, it would bear much fruit. You know, whenever we have a funeral in this church, as we did for Rick Amenrud on uh, this last Friday, uh, through the eyes of faith, we are seeing a new beginning. We are seeing a planting. Just as Christ has died and was buried and is risen from the dead, so it is with us. Just as a body is planted in the ground, a corpse, so it is a seed which will someday sprout and spring up to resurrection life. We are witnessing with every funeral a new beginning if we see it through the eyes of faith. Behold your dying king, for in him is new life. And behold finally that your king, your coming king, comes to judge now is the judgment of this world, says Jesus. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out, and I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. Notice that Jesus says, now. He says it twice, in fact, in that short verse. This is going to happen immediately, in other words. It happened on the cross nearly 2,000 years ago. Now is judgment on the world. Now the ruler of this world, meaning Satan, will be cast out. And that happened nearly 2,000 years ago. Do you believe this? You believe that the devil was decisively defeated by the cross? This calls for faith. This is difficult for a lot of Christians to believe that, that, that through the cross, Jesus effectively bound and tied Satan. Because when we look at the world around us today, it looks like the devil is doing whatever the heck he wants to do. In our darker moments, we might even think that he's winning, that somehow or another darkness is engulfing the light. And we wonder sometimes, you know, is, is good going to win out in this world? We worry about that and we have doubts. But Jesus did judge Satan on the cross and Jesus did bind Satan on the cross. And Satan is presently restrained. He's chained up like a junkyard dog, you know, uh, one of those long chains. Uh, so the junkyard dog can, uh, you know, traverse a lot of ground, and you need to be careful when you go out in that yard because that dog can still render a lot of damage to you. That dog can hurt you. But the truth of it is that Satan is bound, and he's chained, and he's being restrained. Eventually, he will be cast into the lake of fire and destroyed. Can I get an amen on that? <laughs> amen. Amen. Satan will be eternally in the fire of hell. That's his destiny. But, beloved, this calls for faith. This calls for faith. Satan has been judged. Satan is cast out of this world and is being cast out of this world. And Satan was defeated on the cross of Christ 2,000 years ago. What might even, though, call for more intense faith than that 
is to accept God's judgment, not for Satan, but God's judgment of us. So let me illustrate by telling you a story. Uh, Ken Davis is a Christian author and speaker, and he used to tell about a girl in one of his programs who had run away from home and become a prostitute. And one night she lay beaten near, near to death in a dark alley. In desperation, she finally decided to call home. And Davis asked her, what gave her the strength to call home? And she said this. She said, I cheated and lied to my parents for two years before I ran away from home. Mom would try so hard to get through to me, but I treated her like dirt. Almost every day, my mother would tell me that she loved me. She would say to me, there's nothing you can do to make me stop loving you. I never gave her the satisfaction of knowing that her words were getting through. After running away, I would hear those words in every quiet moment. After being beaten senseless, I was lying in that filthy alley, ashamed and beyond hope. My drugged and beaten brain could only handle one thought, or maybe we could say only one judgment. One thought, judgment. There is nothing that you can do that will make me stop loving you. So I picked up the phone and called my mom. I may have given up on myself, but there was hope that she had not given up on me. You see, this young woman, her judgment on herself was death, but her mother's judgment on her was life and love. So, are you worried about how Jesus will judge you? Well, I got to tell you, it's too late. It's too late for that because it already happened 2,000 years ago. It already happened, and praise God that it did. You know, the prophets would sometimes refer to Jerusalem as a prostitute, and they would pronounce their judgment, and the judgment was death and destruction. But Jesus, Jesus is God's judgment, and He calls Jerusalem his bride. His bride, that's his judgment. And 2,000 years ago, on the night that he was betrayed, Jesus offers this judgment on you and me and all who would follow in his steps. Here's his judgment. This cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. For the forgiveness of sins. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. That's His judgment upon you. And today, in a few minutes, you're going to hear these words. The blood of Christ shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. In a few minutes, you might be hearing the subscript in the background, Behold, your King is coming to you. So when we receive communion in faith, we repent. We repent of our judgment of ourselves, and we receive God's loving judgment of us in Christ. So come to the table. Come to the table and receive the judgment of Christ upon you. And so on this day that we call Palm Sunday, let's once again determine not to follow what the world calls wise or powerful or prestigious. Instead, follow the man on the donkey. Follow the troubled Messiah who comes to us in our sufferings. Follow the dying Christ who in his death makes the way to life. Follow the Messiah who has judged Satan on the cross and who casts him out of the world and draws the nations to himself 
and follow the Messiah who in fact has judged us through his blood upon the cross. Behold, your king comes to you. Amen. Please rise as you're able. And together, let us proclaim our faith using the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated as we continue to worship by giving our tithes and offerings to the Lord. Um, we'll do just the first two verses, please, of uh, how deep the Father's love for us. Let us pray for the whole church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Lord God, your Son humbled himself to the point of death, even death on a cross. Fix our faith upon his death for our salvation. Enrich the proclamation of the gospel and enliven our hearts to live out this faith until Christ comes again in glory. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, uphold this world in your order. Preserve the church and the preaching of your word against all enemies. Preserve our homes, that parents and children may serve one another faithfully and grow in instruction and faith until life's end. Lord, in your mercy. Lord of hosts, your son came to deliver his people from all evil. Take away the fear of all who suffer in this world, especially Alice Seams, Ray Peterson, Gloria Amundrud, 
Gregory Easton, Jr., Bill Bridget, Clifford Headland, Art Thole, Leona Wenzel, Merle Williamson, Alice Barasa, June Holman, Eileen Wabner, Mike O'Neill, Ron Sieberson, Sr., Phyllis Swenson, Leland Root, Ruth Hawker, Dale Loken, and all those we now name silently in our hearts. Lord, in your mercy. Bless as well, Lord, the household of Randy and Denise Sieberson, as well as Matt Sieberson and his fiancée, Rachel Breck. Bless these dear brothers and sisters with strong faith, joy, and a true heart and zeal to serve you in their lives and vocations. Bless also the family of Michael Coy, including Alice Seams, as they grieve his loss. Lord, in your mercy. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We praise you, Father, that you have sent your Son not in wrath, but in mercy. As we enter this most holy week and ponder together your great salvation, show us the answer to your people's prayers of Hosanna in the passion of our Lord Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please rise. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. As often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Taught by our Lord and trusting in his promises, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated. All things are now ready. Please follow the guidance of the ushers as you come to the table of the Lord. Come, eat and drink for yourself.